and your pull arm classes were charged twice as much. Uh, so not only is this just in the back of the book because they felt like it, uh, it's not only in the back of the book because these are less common to be used on one on one, but it's also right. There's an assumption that this material is harder, uh, and thus is for more advanced students. So it's okay if you haven't studied the Bolognese at all, uh, but just be warned, like this class is gonna like jump in a little deep pretty quick. Uh, if folks wanna turn, if you are here uh, and you don't have your camera on, feel free to turn your camera on. Uh, if you have some sort of large stick to do these with, we're gonna start walking through some plates. So I can see like one of you on camera and you're sitting down. So we're gonna get up, we're gonna start moving around, we're gonna figure out in our hands what these plates feel like. Uh, if you want to add an extra layer of detail and you have gauntlets, feel free to put them on. Uh, I am not going to put mine on because I have like switched in this book and this halberd and I don't wanna take out a light, uh, but working in gauntlets is definitely gonna change that. So this is the only chapter we have uh, where they're in full armor. And it's one of the last sources we have for armored combat in period. Uh, there's one other chapter that talks about a sword and armored glove. But this is, it just says in full armor. Uh, there's no pictures though, so we don't have any like pictures. Uh, this is also for those of us who are joining later. Uh, this is, I like, I like doing these as discussion classes as well as a hands-on like, thing. Uh, so if you have questions, I'm gonna like, throw stuff at you, like please unmute and like ask stuff. So let's look at the first play in this chapter. Uh, if you happen to have the book at home, you're looking at this later, uh, and this Stephen brought his translation, it's on page 235. So the play reads, uh, if you have a pole axe, so this is gonna be my stand-in pole axe, even though it's technically a halber, in Guardia Alta. So Guardia Alta, so Guardia is a guard, Alta means high, so Guardia Alta, which we have a better description of with the sword, I, I can't quite form in my apartment, but it points straight up or up and behind you a little bit, right? So I might, that's very short, right? This might be Guardia Alta, or this might be Guardia Alta. We're pointing straight up in my Chicago studio apartment. So if you have a Polex in Guardia Alta with your left foot forward, and your right hand high. Uh, so note that, right, with a sword, I'm not gonna switch hands a bunch, and even the long sword material, they only show with the right hand on top. Uh, this material though does show, right, assuming everyone is right-handed, we do see plays of both right hand on top and left hand on top. They're specifying the right hand is on top, your left foot is forwards, and your tip is being held on. Uh, from here, and if your enemy has his left hand low on the heel of this pole axe, so he's probably standing about the same way you are, he might just be choked down here a little farther. On the heel of this pole axe, then pass forward with your right foot, so our right foot is behind us, and we step forwards, and throw a mandrito to his head. So a mandrito, we have mandriti and we have reversi, are our two kinds of cuts. Mandrito is a four-handed cut, so if I'm right-handed, it's gonna cut from right to left. And the reverso, right, I already crossed here, I'm reversed, right, that's gonna be a reverso. So that was a lot of setup, but I'm here. Sort of, or uh, pole axe points up, I cut into their head. Now, what might, See, if we're doing this as an armored play, uh, does anything about that initial move strike people as odd? You have to unmute. It definitely presumes that you have to be armored because at the beginning you're completely exposed with the initial move, except for the link. Uh, say that closer to the mic. 
it really leaves you exposed except for like the actual like pole of the halberd to protect you. So it really does presume that you're being armored when you're doing that, I think. Yeah, it definitely, it, it leaves you exposed as a starting play. But we do in fact see you starting from Guardia Alta. Uh, actually, I'll grab a sword just to demonstrate. Uh, we see this same opener happen a lot, even with the single sword. Oh. Right, I'm out of measure. Right, I step into measure with this cut. So the part that draws my eyes a little bit more is that they're cutting against someone's head while wearing armor. Oh, so because even with an ax, you can't really cut through the metal of the helmet. So yeah, so right, if we were wearing armor and I have a sword, right, I have this one-handed sword and I cut you in the helmet, it probably isn't going to do a ton of damage. Right, and remember this is, right, so it's one person fighting another person in armor. Uh, this isn't the SCA uh, Rattan version where we're using it to score points, where we're fighting in harness faction with this point scoring system. Uh, right, these are people like in 16th century plate armor with like certain parts covered in chain. Uh, so if I just do this into your head, it's going to bounce off and not do anything. Uh, but what this implies to me is that while the sword won't do much, pole axes are big enough that I can actually generate enough force for this to dent your helmet. Uh, if you're talking to some of the Battle of the Nations people, right, the thing they're not, they're not scared about sword hits to the head. They're, so, they're scared of shield punches and they're scared of pole axes. Right, the amount of force coming into that strike, right, it's farther away from the point of rotation, it's more mass going into it. All of the mass is on that end as opposed to hitting the hilts. And I'm using two hands to do that. So this is telling us that even with 16th century technology for armor, right, and this is about when armor stops to go up because uh, they have guns, uh, right, even at this like fairly high height of armor, that action is still threatening enough someone has to respond to it. So let's continue from there. Uh, So you do this and it compels your enemy to defend himself with his ax or his half, right? So you might parry with the, with the ax head, you might stop it in the middle with the half of his body. Uh, after they do that, so now, uh, then it says, and now the halves of your pull axes are crossed together. Be aware that your enemy may pass forward with his left foot, so it implies that they're starting with their right foot forward, whereas you start with your left foot forward. Uh, they can pass with his left foot, beat the heel of his pole axe into your half, and follow that by striking your face with the heel of his pole axe. So, you get caught up in the middle here, he beats you aside, and stabs you in the face. Uh, so, again, right, so the cut didn't work, the theory of the cut, what is our opponent's response telling us about the equipment being used at the time? It would again be like the blunt force trauma of even the butt spike to the face is enough to do something. Say that again? Is that even though it doesn't have a sharp bit on it, just like the blunt force trauma of having like the butt having like the butt of the halberd to the face is enough to respond as well. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. So mine does not have a butt spike uh, because this is just for parades. And if I rest this on my foot, it'll then hurt. Uh, but I think that you're telling us that they do, they are using a butt spike, right? They are having a thing stiff pointing on this end. Uh, and that either like their visors are going to have enough of an opening or they're using a more open face helm. I don't know a ton about the history of armor, but it's implying that a, th a face thrust with, right, they're gonna have an iron burr probably at the bottom of this, a good cone, but that face thrust is enough to end the fight. So, right, this is the one pull arm I happen to own. It's not the one being used in this play. Uh, but I wasn't going to go buy a 16th century pole axe just for this one. Maybe someday. Uh, 
for them to face with the heel of his bullet. So in that tempo, when he goes to beat your hand, right, so you're caught in the middle, uh, raise your pole axe high and make his blow go in vain. So you're, you're caught in the middle, right, and he's trying to push you out of the way, and you lift up high so his strike with the butt of his pole axe doesn't do anything. Then immediately, give him an axe blow to the head. So again, we see, right, at this point, we're really charged up, right? We're here. That's gonna come in hard, right? I'm not just pointing upwards, right? I have all of that rotation to go. Uh, and with a sharp, like, huge hunk of steel at the end of a pole, right, that's gonna dent some helmets. And note that you may perform this action whenever your poleaxe is crossed with your opponent's poleaxe, and he goes to strike you with the heel of his poleaxe. So one of the things that all of the masters of the time realize is that they can never write down every permutation of a play, right? It's just impossible. There's always something else that'll come up. So he gave us a specific example of I start with my left foot forwards, and they're starting with their right foot forwards. And I throw this cut, and then they parry me in the middle. And then they come up, they try and come up, right, and I push them up here, and then I cut down into their head. Uh, but what the play is teaching us is not to only do it in this circumstance, uh, but that here's a specific example to demonstrate the wider lesson of when you get caught in mezza accia, as they call it, uh, which is like the middle of the spear. Uh, so they have, with the swords, they have mezza spada, the middle of the sword, right, when you're caught at that point. And you have to do something. So they have mezza accia for forms. Uh, accia just means steel. From here, you can always push push theirs up, and then come down hard on top of their head. It's always a valid attack. All right. And similarly, if you get caught up here, another valid tactic is up is to push the opponent here and stab them in the face with the butt spike. They're just a <coughs> Great. That's our first play. Uh, if we skip a little farther forward, so if we go two plays ahead, uh, the next setup, so I picked out a few specific ones. Uh, there are, fourteen uh, plays in this chapter, and we're not going to do all of them, because we only have so much time. Uh, so the next one says, if you are in Guardia Alta with your left foot forward, so again, our pole axe is pointing straight up, and our probably higher than I'm holding it. I'm just running out of the ceiling, uh, and our left foot is forwards. And your enemy attacks your head. So this time, the enemy makes the first move. The enemy attacks our head. What you are going to do, uh, to do pass forward with your right foot. So instead of stepping back and parrying, we are stepping forwards with our right foot. Extend your arms well and receive his attack on the half of your pole axe between your hands. So we don't just want to parry off the side, but we are stopping it here. Uh, ideally, we are stopping it with our haft on their half. If we stop it with our haft on their axe head, they're going to cut through the haft. Uh, in certain pole arms, uh, you'll see metal strips that run down the sides for the like foot or so, uh, and those help mitigate that issue of having them cut your pole arm off. Uh, and also just gives your axe head more structural stability. But those are only going to run down so far, right? They're not going to run down to here. So you have to aim it so that they don't cut uh, through your haft, and that also that you're stopping them far enough up that it doesn't hit you in the head, right? So if I stop their blow like here, their pole axe is just gonna rock over the top of that half that's gonna hit you in the head. So I have to find that sweet spot around here-ish where I'm stepping forwards and intercepting.
So we pass forward with our right foot and we extended our arms and we caught them. Then we're going to pass forward with our left foot. And immediately, so this is going to be, uh, so this is, I didn't mention already, this is a Marshall ANS class and not a things you can ever do in a tournament class. Because uh, the thing we're about to do is not list legal. But it is period, so we're going to read about it and then never put it into full speed practice. Uh, and then, so you, you step forward with the right foot, you stop them. Now you're going to step forward with your left foot and immediately turn the foot of your poleaxe over his head with your left hand. Take him by the neck from his left side, and then with all possible skill and strength, throw your enemy to the ground. So I wrap this behind his head. I pull down here, and then probably I'm going to compass out with the right foot. Uh, I'm going to do it stronger than I can in my small apartment. I'm going to shove his head all the way into the floor. Don't do this in tournament. It will be bad. Uh, I'm not an armored marshal, but I feel like they will not like it if you do that. Wait, why exactly would they not want you to do this in tournament as Hello. somebody who's completely new and doesn't know anything? Say that again? As somebody who's, complete, who's completely new to, um, to the combat scene in the SCA, why exactly would that be a bad thing to do to like bring people? Uh, you're not allowed to throw people. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, you are, there's a certain segment of cut and thrust that I may, not, may or may not be slightly in charge of where we do allow some grapples. Uh, and again, I am not an armored marshal, so I can only speak so far. But to my knowledge, there's a lot of armored fighting in the SCA or we get like core core, right? We're like body to body. Or throwing strikes around people. Uh, I've never seen a match where you poke your polex over their head and you shove their face into the floor as hard as possible. Probably because that's how you can cuss me. Uh, so don't do that in a tournament. But like, it's cool to know that they did that. Good uh, to know. Right. This is describing. We don't have a lot of setup for this, but it seems to be that this is describing a duel. Uh, so duels, are, at this period of time, aren't fought to first blood. Like, first blood is like a 19th century thing because too many officers killed each other uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. What it, it's a duel to incapacitation or to death. Uh, so if you aren't able to hold up a sword anymore, or you can't walk, the duel's over. <coughs> Sometimes that is accomplished by me killing you. Right, if I cut you in the head with this, the duel is over because you're dead. Uh, but similarly, right, if I kneecap you with a pole axe, and then I just kind of step back and you bleed out a bunch, like they're gonna call it because you're not gonna be able to continue. So in this instance, right, I like WWE slammed your face into the floor with the pole axe. Uh, a, so I'm not entirely sure uh, if they're gonna call it at that point, but like you shouldn't need a ton of instruction on how to beat someone with a poleaxe when they're face down in the ground like an ostrich, and you can just like do things, uh, right? If you need someone to tell you what to do there, like this book isn't the book for you. Like, you need to go several steps back. Uh, so there's a lot of times they like just leave the end of the fight blank because obviously like it's fine. Like I threw the dude and I have weapons. Right, because if you have common sense and you're like trained in a culture where fighting's actually a thing, you'll actually know what to do at that point and you know just be yeah. uh, So uh, we don't see any plays of I have a dagger and they don't have anything because like if you have the weapon and they don't, like you just win. stab them. If they have a dagger and you don't, there's a lot of things you can do. If you have the dagger and they don't, you stab them with the knife. Look, it's pretty, you don't need an instruction manual for that. So, this time, we, so they, they try to strike first. So we caught them, we stepped towards the left foot, we caught them on the half, we stepped towards the right foot, hooked our half behind their head, and then threw them into the ground face first. So here again, we saw another Metza Achia play, right? So we came half to half, and from there, we used a grapple to throw. Uh, grappling shows up a ton in period armored combat. 
uh, because a lot, right, I can't just throw all these cuts to your body because they'll bounce off. So when I get in close, A, everyone knows how to grapple at this point, B, right, your joints will still run out of, like, regardless of how good your armor is, if I make your joints go to full extension, your armor doesn't help you. Right, your shoulder will still run out of flexibility at the same spot, if not earlier, if you're in armor. Uh, so by me, like, twisting your neck and throwing it to the floor, right, that is a armor-proof technique. Uh, because it's not a blunt force come up from the sword, it's your face going into the... <laughs> so next, he gives us the play that we're going to skip. Uh, he then gives us three pieces of advice. Uh, that aren't full plays in themselves, but I find them interesting nonetheless. Uh, so the next one, again, don't do this in SC Armored Combat. Uh, it says, be aware that when you find yourself at Metsa Achia, so in the, you're at the middle of the half, middle of the half, with your enemy, you will always be able to drive the heel of your polax into his foot. So in SC Armored Combat, they don't allow strikes below the knee. Uh, this is implying to us that this is sharp, because if it wasn't sharp and it's going to hit you with the end of the stick in the foot, it will like hurt a bit, but you'll probably kill me. Uh, if I impale your foot though, very effective. This is also implying to us that even though this is later in the period of like in the evolution of armor, that we are not wearing, at least in Bologna at this point, because Italy changes a bunch, they don't have steel on top of their Right, they're probably just wearing regular shoes. Otherwise, if they have steel on top of their feet, when I do this, uh, it won't work for it. This is telling us a little bit about what they're wearing, even though we don't have any pictures for the book. So, right, every time we come to here, we can do a bunch of fancy stuff where we try and get the accent around, or we try and throw them, or I can just slip that down into your foot. And it's a lot easier to fight a one foot. The next piece of advice we get says, you are also advised to throw your enemy to the ground every time you are scuffling with him by hooking his legs, arms, neck, or some other parts of his body with the horn of your poleaxe. Uh, so that's showing us the previous play we did. So the horn most likely refers to the part coming out the back. All right, so the, the pole axe, right, this part is going to be a lot shorter. Like, it's not going to come out as far. That's not going to be great for hooking people, but this bit, Pretty good, right? At any point where I come to here, I can grab your head, I can grab your arm, right? I can pull your leg out from under you with this, which are again things that aren't allowed in SEM or combat, but are allowed in 16th century dueling. So, uh, we don't know if this is written for like, like at this point, the idea of knights in Italy uh, is like very different than what it is in other places. Uh, like we are just starting to run out of everyone else's idea of knights in Italy by the 15th century. By this point, right, the Italy is just using mercenaries everywhere and hiring people out. Uh, so the, their knightly cast isn't the same as our like, Arthurian ideals of the English version of knights. Uh, but clearly, these are people who are rich enough to wear armor. Uh, but they don't. Apparently, they do not find it dishonorable to hook someone's leg and you don't get out from them like a cartoon. This is an acceptable behavior for men rich enough, regardless of their officials, like titles, uh, to do to each other in armor. So again, there are lots and like uh, other texts do a better job of like spend more time on armor. Yuri de Libri, who's writing around 1400, uh, is a knight and does spend a ton of time on armor and has some pictures. Uh, he's doing lots of like long sword armor, but also pole axe and some other weapons. This is about a hundred years later. <coughs> so the armor section is just a little bit at the back, but we see this idea of grappling in armor continue on uh, through the period because cuts to solid pieces of armor don't really do anything. Mainly this will go through someone's head, but like, It'll just kind of bounce off a of breastplate or like it'll sting somewhere else. But if I throw you to the ground, my life is much easier. Right? I don't, and again, like it doesn't tell us the follow up of like, if you threw him, 
What do you do now? Well, I just poke him until he stops breathing. Oh, and it definitely, do, and if I actually might interject with a question there, when we're talking about, um, specifically when we're talking about grappling and taking them down to the ground, are, um, do we normally want to use the butt end of the, of the pole axe, or are there techniques where we also use the main head of the axe? As uh, the so there's both. So the previous play we saw, right, is we hooked the butt around the back of their neck and we threw them down. What this one is telling us to do is whenever possible, uh, hook their head, their arm or their leg with the hook, like with the back end of the head of the axe. Uh, so it essentially, right, when you get into full armored combat, uh, the weapons are less, it matters less that they are sharp or pointy. Pointy matters a bit. Uh, mostly they're grappling weapons. Uh, right, so this book doesn't talk about armored longsword. But, right, when they're fighting an armored longsword in the 15th century, they're not still fighting it here. They're fighting it here, where they're using this to grapple and then shove this point in between the gaps of the arm. Okay. Because uh, that's where the, you can't have a solid piece of metal right there. This doesn't work because your arm has to do this. I might have a chain there, but if I stab really hard, I can break through the chain. Uh, but if I just stab into your breastplate, like that's not going to do. So, Right, they're using these things to throw the other person because all the other cuts and all the other thrusts aren't going to do anything against armor. But grappling, which is like the foundation of what they're all doing, <coughs> still works regardless of what people are wearing. Right, if they have a sword or they're on horseback or they have armor on, uh, I can still throw them into the floor. It works pretty well. Uh, I don't know if you have any grappling experience yourself, but like, Getting, even without like hitting my head on the floor, or because I know how to fall, right? Just being like thrown onto the floor and having the wind take out of you, like, is bad. Like, you stop fighting. Uh, I'm sure there are people who can like deal with it, but like, if someone chucks you into the ground, like it's, and you don't roll out of it, uh, you're not winning them. So, to answer your question, yes, we're using a set both ends of the pole axe to throw. Because this is an opportunity. Uh, and also, one of them hooks around things and makes them easier for the people. And then the third piece of advice uh, that we get right outside of the plays is it says, know that you must never refrain from striking your enemy with a thrust to the face, talked about earlier, uh, or some other, some other part of his body that is unarmored, like the testicles or the groin. So they're not messing around. Uh, please do not take every opportunity possible in SCA combat to stab people in the groin. They won't like you. But if you're trying to kill someone, uh, right, there's going to be a gap in the leg armor here. Right, Henry VIII has a suit of armor that doesn't, but like he was the richest person at the time and thus couldn't afford those things. And also that's still several decades after this. Uh, but like, just stab into the parts that don't have armor. Is apparently a thing he needed to repeat, but like, right, there's still honor in these tools, and there's things you can and you can't do, and apparently groin shots are a thing you can do. Dang. Uh, right, if I hit someone who was already, if I hit someone who was incapable of continuing to fight, right, that is a disarmable thing, right, if I booby trap my weapon, I put blinding powder in the head of the spear and I shoot at someone, which is a thing we do see in Fiori on the battlefield that is dishonorable to do in a duel. Uh, but just shanking people right there, perfectly fine. Because there's no armor there, or there might be, right, they might have like a chain skirt essentially. But I can go through that if I hit hard enough. Again, don't do that to people, they won't like you. But in actual dueling, you probably don't like them because they want to kill you. So, like, differences between our modern sport interpreting history and what's happening in the historical context. 
Uh, there's lots of things in this book that are great that I never want to do in real life because they will hurt and they will hurt my friends regardless of what equipment we own. Uh, but I find it helpful to have that background knowledge of what they're doing to inform the stuff that I am pulling out that I can do at full speed. Uh, also, I'm just a history nerd and I have a giant pile of sort books, so I'll read them. Cool. So now we get back to an actual play. Uh, so this time, uh, it says that we are both in Porta de Ferro Stretta. Uh, so Porta de Ferro guards are the guards on our inside line. Stretta means down. So we're going to be here. Well, probably it's going to be low. So our right foot is in front. Uh, our hands are over our left hip. <coughs> and our pole axe is taking up roughly in the center of our body. So this is Porta de Ferro Alta, and then this is Porta de Ferro Larga. Larga is wide, it's up here. Porta de Ferro Stretta, right about here. Uh, we also see a lot less of the dark people who do lots of like, full uh, harness spectrum. So like armored combat with the rules of I have to stab in between the joints. Which I think you've seen yesterday as much. Uh, I'll tell you, you don't do a lot of more complicated actions just because that are like the full plate armor makes it harder. So I'm taking this pretty basic guard and look for attacks and miss, whereas any like cross armed guard is going to be much harder from our So we and our opponent are both in Porto de Ferro Strata. So our inside line is covered. We're roughly pointing at their face, maybe at their throat. They are doing the same as. We both have a right forward. You can hook his weapon with your horn and yank it towards you with all of your force, trying to take it from his hand. So we're here. We pull. We might have it flip this way or the other way. Right? We pull. We hook behind theirs. And if we fire first, we have better structure. We take away their pole axe, and now we have the only pole axe in the fight. That sounds great. I want the only pole axe in the fight. Having two red pole axes in the fight is dangerous. So if you just yank it out of their hands, damn, you can do that. Uh, but if you do not manage to pluck it away, and he tries to take away your pole axe as you did to his. So again, the problem with that maneuver is unless we are better set up than them, right? We're pretty much equal footing and those can easily lose it. Uh, then he can quickly step forward. So if we're about to lose this thing, we're gonna step forward with our right foot. Remember our right foot is already in front. And with great force, strike your spike into his belly, his groin above his testicles or his throat, making him tumble down backwards with his feet in the air. So if they pull us towards them, stab them. I stab them in the face, stab them in the groin, or stab them in the belly. Now, the last one is interesting because we're often a chest plate is one of the first pieces of armor we're going to buy. Uh, what this is telling us is that, right, oftentimes the chest plate will only come to about here, and then this part will just be chain. So we're probably straightening low enough to get either underneath that chest plate or to pierce the chain. So if we pull and they pull us towards them, instead of trying to disengage or something, we let that action happen and we stab them going forwards with our right foot. Great. Uh, two more. Uh, so the next one says, if your enemy uh, has his left foot forward and the heel of his pole axe is similarly forward. So your enemy is starting here. So instead of this enemy, the enemy is starting here, right, it's going to make that cut a lot more powerful and it also makes that thrust very quick. <coughs> so your enemy starts their left foot forwards with the heel spike pointed at you. Place yourself with your right foot forward and keep your left hand near the hip, near the heel. So I am standing with my right foot forwards, right? Instead of being up here, 
My left hand is going to be near the placing your right hand toward the ax head as high as possible. So I'm going to be about here. My right. Uh, and it does not it doesn't name which guard we're in for this one, which is annoying, but that's what happens when you have unedited manuscripts. Uh, it says to faint with an axe blow to his head and wait for him to raise his pull axe to the dent himself. So he's standing here. He's going to parry this way. I'm standing here. I'm going to cut at his head. So I'm Try not to get stabbed in the process because he is the shorter one. But also, if he just thrusts at me, I'm going to crash down through his hull and slow his head. So he wants to deal with But he's moving upwards to stop the straight. So we think to the axe blow to the head and we wait for him to defend himself. When he does, quickly give him an axe blow in the manner of a mandrito tondo to his front leg. So a mandrito is again a from the right to the left, uh, and a tondo specifically goes straight across. So instead of coming down here, we're coming down this way. We think this attack, we go hya, or we go hya, and then we, as he comes high, we think it high, we think high, pull low, and hit him in the leg. Uh, even if he has shin guards, right, this will likely come in behind him, uh, and the sharp piece of steel coming in at your calf is going to be terrible. Uh, even if he does have steel on his whole leg, right, a lot of force can make your leg. It's a pretty likely way to send you flying into the air. So we think that his head, we cut low, uh, raising his leg from below with this cut, or catching his leg with your horn and throwing him down. So we're not, it looks like we're not striking the leg and cutting it. Uh, but we are instead of lifting the leg, or, all right, so we might lift the leg with the force, or we might faint high, turn it, hook behind, and use that hook to pull his leg out of front. Once again, none of these are list legal in the SCA, don't do these things. But, like, I find them amusing, and this is a class of the obscure chapter all in the back of it. Uh, yeah, forcing them to fall against his will. So we're here. He's here. We faint high. He goes to parry high. And then we pull his leg out from under him. Now he's on the floor, and we have a pull axe, and the rest is self explanatory. Then finally, with the last play, both of this chapter and of the entire book, it says, if you and your enemy both have your left feet forward, both of you have your left hand forward, uh, feign to thrust his face with your heel spike, and in the same tempo, drive your heel spike into his foot. So that's sounding to me like I'm not switching which hand is on top, but my left hand is forwards. I feint this thrust to his face, he parries high again, and then I just drive it, I feint high, and drive it down low into his foot, stapling it into the ground. It doesn't tell us what to do from there, but like grass is near his head, and now his foot is disabled, things in a lot of it. So, those are all of the plays uh, I had planned. Uh, are there any questions about the material covered, about Bolognese, Polax fighting in general. Um, if I might ask, do you know what the context would be for why they would be, why in a dual situation they would be using Polaxes and plate armor as opposed to the more traditional swords? Because we know that that was more the quote unquote dueling weapon or the more severe? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I actually wrote my college thesis on 16th century Italian dueling, which I published and I can send you later uh, if you look me on Facebook. 
Uh, so the idea of duels being traditionally done with just one weapon is actually a much later idea. So by the mid 16th century, <coughs> uh, people are using the sword as the weapon to do duels with. Uh, specifically, they're using sword unarmored on foot to duel with. Uh, if we look back at Fiori, for instance, who's writing around 1400, uh, he witnessed multiple duels, like one of a few of his students got into duels. He supposedly won several. Uh, but we only have his first person account to believe that. Uh, but we have other corroborated accounts of him being as well as duels, where they'll start, they'll be in armor, start on horseback with lances, and then end up on the ground with daggers. In armor. Uh, so the idea that we both just start out of measure in our clothes with a sword uh, is, a, is a much later concept. Uh, and even with that, right, most of this book, like most of this book is on swords, one chapter is on pull arms. Yeah. So they're mostly dueling by between 1510 and 1550 when this is written. Uh, they're mostly dueling with swords, uh, especially, right, like these things are expensive. <coughs> so there are upper class people dealing with swords, middle class dueling looks kind of different and it's less formal. Uh, the important thing of a duel though is less what specific weapon we have. Uh, the more important bit is that the weapons are matched. So the way duels are set up, if I challenge you to a duel, right, if I, if I say a thing, right, if I say that like your sister is a lousy cook, and you say you are a liar, sir. I I would say I'm not a liar. I challenge you to a duel. Right, her borscht was terrible, or whatever. Uh, or like focaccia is terrible. I guess for being it down. Uh, right, me saying that, me saying I am not a liar. I challenge you. Right, what that does for me is I get to choose the time and place. Uh, what you, as the person who said, do you lie? Uh, get to do is you get to choose the weapon. Do you want to be the guy who chooses weapons? Uh, weapons are way more important than time and place. Time, because if I specifically do it like right, then like the time of day matters a little less because it's fair, it's generally uh, around dusk. Uh, but if I do it like at my best friend's backyard, it looks bad and I'm picking that place and it looks like I have scoped it out. Uh, so I want to pick a place that looks neutral. Uh, but you can, if you know that I'm a bad polearm fighter, but I'm really good with swords, you're going to be like, great, fight pull arms. Don't say terrible things about people in public. Uh, so it serves as a deterrent for saying things about people by the guy saying, you lie, getting to pick the weapon set. Uh, so yeah, we have lances, we have, and oftentimes, right, uh, and early, if we go earlier to this book, right, a, a knight will have a lance, a sword on one hip, and a dagger on the other. And they might go into the duel with all of that on a horse and walk out of it with whatever comes out of it. Uh, but as long as we have, as long as we're wearing the same level of armor, we're both starting on horseback and we have the same essential kinds of weapons, right? We're both fighting sword and buckler, we're both fighting long sword, right? Our swords are about the same like, uh, that's what the, the thing that matters more is that they're matched. Definitely, yeah. so it was, so as like a general rule, if you were of the upper strata of society, <clears throat> so as like a general rule then, if you were in the upper strata of society, you would have to own both a sword and a poleaxe and then like whatever other kind of weaponry was like common for dueling? Yeah, so those just be, uh, so at this point in history, uh, and there's like another great book on this. Uh, if you actually, it's right here, I'll sweep it in the camera. Uh, so this is German, but the martial ethic in early modern Germany uh, is a whole book just talking about that. Great book, highly recommend it. So I know more about that context in the Italian context, but they are just kind of now, the idea of having a full-time professional military is a thing that comes in and out of fashion throughout history. <coughs> Right, like sort of like Alexander the Great was like really clever because he had one and people did it, etc. Uh, so this is a time, especially right in Italy, 
and in the Holy Roman Empire, which we now think of as Germany, it's mostly city states, right? It's not large federal governments. True. Uh, so being a citizen of the town of whatever in Germany, uh, being a citizen, this is more like the early American idea of citizenship than it is the 21st century idea of citizenship. So everything like land owning men. Uh, part of your duty as a citizen of Hamburg or wherever in Germany is you had to have some level of armor, probably a breastplate and a helmet, a poleaxe, and then depending on when and time, a oh, poleaxe, probably a sword, and depending on time, a crossbow or a gun. Uh, and it's just like how we serve jury duty now as part of being a citizen of America. Uh, once, depending on how many people you have, once every however many months, you would take a shift doing guard duty. So you would stay up all night, uh, you put on your armor, you walk around with the polex that you brought to muster, uh, and you walk around, you like walk in the town, because they also don't have a police force <coughs> or that many lights. And then you also like you're the dude on the ramparts in case the next town over got angry at you. Uh, and eventually this gets professionalized, but for a long time they didn't. Uh, so you as part of being a citizen, you are, you're supposed to have. Well, everyone did. A lot of people like, lied about that, and there was a fine for lying. Uh, one of the things that does end up happening with dueling culture, specifically, is duels are really only between people of the same social class, right? So we're both nobles, or we're both merchants, or we're both peasants. There's not a lot of like peasant versus, versus noble dueling. Uh, but even within that, income can walk, like vary pretty widely especially since nobility is passed down and isn't always tied to having anything besides a name. Uh, so if I challenge you to a duel and you didn't own the thing uh, that we were going to fight with, I had to provide you with that. So sometimes there's a public armory, right? The town might just like collectively buy a bunch of spears and like basic arming swords and helmets and breastplates. And I would go to, if dueling is, legal or mostly legal in that town, I'm able to borrow from public armory, or I might, out of my own pocket, have to buy you a thing to match whatever I bring. Wow. Which is not a deterrent against dueling, is it's got, it might be expensive to do, also you're gonna die, also here's a bunch of other stuff. They didn't watch the duel, kind of. It happened a bunch. The state kind of let it just happen, but there's lots of steps, both like, in legal processes, as well as things that become cultural law that aren't like in the legal code, but like if you break this norm, it's bad. Uh, right, at one point, I was talking to someone yesterday about how, maybe it was two days ago, like if you were got into like an impromptu duel and like you hid behind farming equipment, the dude had to stop trying to fight you because now there's collateral damage and now people can't farm and I don't know so there's always like very specific rules. Uh, but yeah, if you're, especially if you're upper middle class or you're a nobleman, you probably own the, A, you definitely owned a horse. B, you definitely knew how to ride that horse. Uh, no one talks about how to ride a horse until I think the 18th century, if not the 19th. It's like, obviously you know how to ride a horse. Uh, and you're born on it. So you have a horse, you probably have a sword. You might not have the fanciest RV, you have a sword. And you probably have a four just like in your house. Uh, so yeah, there's some general like weapons going around, but you might have to borrow one or you, someone might like purchase or like lend you this. Cool. Any other questions? I actually do want to ask, you're, um, because we've been mentioning horses a lot today, was it actually like a known thing to fight Polax on a horse? And if so, was that like, some, or was that like, more of an in the past in the days when the knights were at their heyday they would fight on horseback but once we actually get to this point we really weren't uh, in the full so poleaxes no uh a poleaxe is a two-handed weapon and you need one hand to hold the reins of the horse true so lance right like the jousting kind of lance but more deadly made of harder wood is a thing you could duel with 
right? Or an arming sword or a, right? You'd have a dagger as a backup weapon. Uh, but you're not like, right? Like this giant, like this big two-hander I have, right? Like I'm 5'10". This is not a thing you ride on horseback with. It's just too big, right? I can't like pull it out one-handed, right? And I can't do this and ride the horse, right? This is a bad weapon for swinging one. Not definitely. Make this sense. is like from the 1570s, so the hilt is a little too late period for it. But like, I can I can't ride a horse, but like I can swing this at you one-handed as this hand goes with the horse. Uh, but this is specifically this is an infantry like pull axe is an infantry weapon. Uh, now you as a depending on when in time you are right, you as a knight going into battle might have squires that have that trail you, that have backup weapons for you, with them, uh, that might hand you a thing. But like, no, this isn't fit on a horse well. I, like, it's just unwieldy to swing this at people. And I can stab you, or I can one-handed cut you. But like, this is not, this is a halberd. Like, a pole axe is not a, there's nothing, I do not believe there's anything about pole axes on horseback. Uh, but there are duels on horseback in the 15th century. They happen a bunch. But like, and as we get into, as we approach the 17th century, duels get narrower and narrower into no one has armor and we're all just using one sword. Uh, and eventually pistols come around. But there's like a very long period of time where it's just mashed weapons, and we including armor and horses, like whether you're using those or not. Uh, as long as you have the same thing as your opponent. There's exceptions to that rule, but like those are the main. And occasionally people will like, I'm on horseback and I got angry at you and I challenged you to a fight and then we fought it out there and, it was, and then there was a whole legal thing. Uh, <coughs> but most of the time, if it's a formal aristocratic duel, we have the same things as the other person. Because that way, I didn't win by cheating, I won by being better and also God choosing, cho choosing me to win. But like they're very religious, but also they're still training for the fight. It's like, they know they have to go for this. Definitely. But, like those are simultaneous truths to a 16th, 15th century person. Definitely. And then just as kind of like a follow-up to the whole match weapons thing, I know that with like poleaxes and with halberds and with everything in this general category of weapon, the heads can vary widely from like what exactly the shape of each thing is and like what elements are on each head. If yeah. two, hypothetically, if two things are considered flax, they have a spike, an axe, a hook, and then something on the butt. And uh, pardon my pun, pardon how that was worded. Um, but basically, if they have all those elements, but they don't really look exactly the same, would they still be considered matched? Or do you actually have to go to an artisan to make sure that everything? like looks exactly as long as they're like functionally the same it's probably fine right similarly so it's everything is handmade uh so the idea right like uh you can it's so like this is like a chablowski long like long sword trainer uh and you can call up chablowski and you can get this exact same model and this will be exactly the same like length and it'll have the same flex and it'll weigh the same number of grams as the one i am uh they don't have that because it's all handmade. Uh, so especially like sword hilts, like 16th century sword hilts get real crazy. Like there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, so yeah, there's gonna be some level of variation. Uh, a lot of the variation we're seeing on pull arms <coughs> is because we are looking back on all of this history at once, right? It would likely be the fashion of the day for all the pull arms in this one area of Europe to do this one thing with some variation, uh, but like this is a specifically like German halberd from this one specific, I don't remember when in Germany, uh, right? An Italian halberd is gonna look different. Uh, so a lot of it is like, wh like what decade you're in, where you are. But yeah, it, there's some, there's gonna be some level of variation just cause there's no factories. True. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's all the questions that I really have. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I really appreciate it. I like 
ran across this chapter the other day while I was talking to someone about the book, and I've been thinking about doing a thing with it, and this forced me to like study it. So hopefully you learned a thing. This is going to be recorded for everyone who wants to go back and watch it on YouTube on the Rome channel. Uh, thank you all so much. My name is Warder Rafael Di Marisi. It was my pleasure getting to teach all of you. Have a nice day.